those of you who are just joining us, I'm Peter Reinhardt, and we're here with Apollonia Poilan, coming to us from Paris, France. Uh, I'm holding up a uh, sort of a- Eternal a, loaf. Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is the pillow loaf of the famous uh, iconic Poilan, uh, I call it the country niche. I don't know if, if that's the right term for it or mm -hmm. what you use for it, but uh, yeah. uh, this is what it looks like. It uh, weighs uh, about two kilos or four pounds when you got a loaf. It's people over there, when I was there, people would just buy one and, and work it off for the first, for, you know, over the, the next week or so. It lasts quite well. And uh, this is where kind of where it all starts for us as bread people. This is the loaf that, that sort of we know, but there's a whole lot more going on at, at the boulangerie besides this loaf. Uh, Apolloni, um, we're gonna give you a chance to tell your story a little bit of, of how, you know, you, your journey to being the, essentially the proprietress and the, I, I, are you co-owner with your sister still of the, of the bakery? I am. So my name is Apolloni Poilin and I am the third generation baker in charge of Poilin Bakery. It was started in 1932 by my grandfather. My father took over in the 70s and structured, developed the company into this extra national company, whether it's because we export or because we've been this year for 20 years in London. Um, but I have also taken over and followed his footsteps this fall 18 years ago. So that is time. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time. It seems like just yesterday to all of us who woke up one morning to this uh, just horrifying headline that, that your parents had been, had perished in a helicopter crash in, in France and that the entire country of France had gone into mourning and, and everyone wondered what's going to become of the bakery. And mm. uh, that's where, and yet at the time, if I understand the story correctly, you were, uh, had just started uh, studies at Harvard in uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You, so you were over here on this side, right? So Your not mom. quite, not quite actually. Um, so I um, I was taking a year off before I went to college. So I was actually working in the bakehouse oh, wow. um, around the time my parents passed away, um, as you mentioned, um, in in a crash. Um, my father was passionate and uh, professional grade pi pilots. Um, and um, I received the news um, on October 31st that um, the helicopter had crashed. And the natural thing for me was, well, I um, will be stepping up and will be in charge of the family's business because even though it's much, much sooner than what I had planned for, this is where I'm going in life. And this is my life and project and ambition. And, uh, and suddenly it was thrust upon you. Uh, and yet you still had college waiting. So you had to deal with I did. Kind of being, I did. being on both sides of the pond uh, for a number of years. Uh, That's while, correct. While also taking the reins of the bakery. Uh, yes. So, so yeah, I ahead. took, so, so, so we're in the fall of 2002, I'm taking a year off before I go to college and my parents pass away in this accident. And there's no question for me of whether I'm taking over the family business or not. This is my calling. This was where I wanted to go in life. Um, I stepped up and I had about 10 months ahead of me to decide what I was doing with my college admission. And being admitted at Harvard, <laughs> helping very, very much my decision. Um, for four years, I commuted between Paris and Boston, um, taking, rounding back on my end of the world, um, the uh, college and, uh, students um, and friends, my co-founders with whom I would share bread every week when I had my weekly bread delivery. Um, and we, um, and we, we went to, and you know, and they would go and visit and I would take care of my family's business. Um, and in 2007, I graduated with a degree in economics and I have resumed to a full-time job um, at the bakery without homework. Yeah, right, right. But uh, now that you are back, you know, full-time at the bakery and have been, um, do, you, do you get time to actually bake or are you also mostly running the, the company? Yeah. So 
because I, because when I, once I graduated, I had literally more time to be baking and doing other, engaging in other activities and passions um, to further develop the, the family's business, but also just, you know, like some, some of my college mates um, were engaged in extracurricular activities, sometimes at a professional level. My, my activity was my, my bakery. Um, once college was over, that was time that was freed up to work in the bakehouse. And that's where you'll typically find me on a Saturday. Mm. Um, and I'll do this both to further my practice, but also to develop new recipes. Um, because I firmly believe that if you want to develop um, some R&D, if you want to work on, on new products, you really need to understand how they're going to insert themselves into our reality, our um, stone, our, our brick oven, um, using our stone ground flour, using our hand methodologies, and, and that that's, can't really be done in the lab, or it would be so much time wasting adapting it then to, to, to the bakehouse that I feel like we might as well work there. So yes, mm -hmm. I still work in the bakery and it's, I can tell you, it is one of my favorite places, yeah. even on a warm day where it can be absolutely wretched hot outside. The bakehouse may be steaming hot, but it is a place where you feel enveloped by the heat. Yeah. It's yeah. the heat that nurtures you. It, it's the heat that makes you feel at home. Um, and it's no surprise that it has over the years developed this environment that favors the production of our, of our breads. Yeah. Like just the, the, natural microorganisms they probably exactly live or happily live in the walls and everywhere I, yeah. Yeah. I think there's some happy there are some happy organisms down there <laughs> you know, when I had my bakery uh, many years ago Saturday was always my favorite day too because it was the day that I could have the, I could be the head baker and I could be baking and doing you know whatever development work but also just do the production of the day and not right? have yeah. the distractions of running the business and which not which having I, a phone call not yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. so it was a day i always looked forward to and uh so i totally get that um and speaking of new products so you last year came out with this book at least mm -hmm. uh, uh, i don't know if this was first written in french or was this always a, an english uh you know kind of project no it was so i so i went to college and this is where I did a lot of writing work. So writing in English came all the more naturally that I also wanted to um, tell the story of the family's bakery in English because we didn't have an English language book. Um, I had had a summer experience where I had kept the bread for over a week, which when I advertised people to eat it within, you know, around five days. And so my thought process was, I need to share with the world my admiration at my grandfather and my father's work at how enthusiastic I can be having been at that point over 10 years into the family business and, and or at the head of the family business, but having, you know, essentially worked there all my life mm -hmm. or having like, just like from, from the crib my parents made for me, which was uh, converted baker's basket to my Wednesdays and Saturdays afternoons spent learning how to count um, in the bakery um, or preparing all of the orders um, or helping out with the admin. And so all of that just really um, fueled my desire to share a little slice into what the bakery is like. How does it feel from morning until midnight um, and so that's why the book is structured around the morning the time where I usually work in the bakery um, the, the the day and how to enjoy bread from the crust to the very last crumb mm -hmm. and also how over the years I really developed my outlook on bread how I see my craft as that crossroads between cereal grains and fermentation mm -hmm. and how that has led me um, to work on my cornbread, my 100% corn flour breads. Um, and is that a new other product, experimentations. That product, you, the product that you brought into the bakery or was, was there one that? Yes. Was, 
Wow. No, there wasn't. So historically, Poilin works around two grains, wheat and rye. Mm. And every time we do it with 100% wheat flour, 100% rye flour. And so when I started, when I was in college, I would have cornbread and I kept on thinking like, oh, it'd be great to do a cornbread. But looking at the recipes, I would always find that it was half wheat, half corn, which made zero sense to me because right. for me, a cornbread would be a bread of corn flour. So, so I was like, okay, I am going to do a 100% corn flour bread. Wow. But once, once you realize that no gluten means like no binding, right. then the challenge came on. And it was 10 years, more or less, not full on working on it, but 10 years between the moment I set that challenge and the moment the bread came out in the bakehouse or in the store, because I, I wanted to keep the simplicity of the ingredients that we put into our, our, our wheat and our rye breads um, and, and have a binder that wouldn't have any um, ingredients that are less known or less interesting or just less familiar with bread baking like mm -hmm. for all the gums didn't make sense to me um or i was just wondering like what are the long-term effects of eating those um eggs made zero sense this is a bread not a brioche that i'm baking sugar same thing i'm baking a bread not sweet mm -hmm. um so so all of those things really shaped I was going to say façonné, which is the French word, you know, to say that we're shaping the loaf. And it really yeah. was shaping, the shaping of that thought and the ethos. Um, and it not only helped me develop the recipe, but ultimately also fed my philosophy and understanding of my crafts, my outlook on it, and the way I would develop our sourdoughs, metaphorically speaking. Yeah. Well, you, it's quite a challenge to take on the, to create a cornbread with, uh, with no... All corn, 100% corn, you know, no gums, none of the, the tricks of the trade that kind of hold it together. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm curious myself, how did you manage that? What, what is the secret to, and in fact, so, you weren't even using eggs, so how did you bind it all? Exactly. So, first of all, in my book, Poilan, um, and it's, uh, it was published about a year ago at Houghton Mifflin Harker. Beautiful book. Um, I have an at-home version. Um, that I uh, put in that's adapted from our bakery's recipe. Uh, because at the bakery, we've developed our own sourdough. So the, the starting point was, how do we recreate the simplicity of the ingredients of our wheat sourdough loaf? Sourdough, wheat flour, salt, and water. So the compromise came, and of course, I'm forced, I'm like, giving you an extreme fast forward beyond this, but basically I replaced the water with oat milk. Um, oat milk and flax seeds bound together create the, a binding that replaces the effects of gluten. Uh, but these are products that are of grains. Um, I have, so I have at the bakery, I have a corn sourdough I, salt is salt, <laughs> um, corn flour replaces the wheat flour. And instead of water, I have a combination of flax seeds and the oat milk that creates a binding. That's so it's a bread, and it's a bread that uh, will keep a little less long than um, my wheat or my rye sourdough bread. It only keeps for three, four days, which is still more than a lot of the white breads or yeah. the smaller formats that you can find. But that would, that's my, my thought process. My starting point was I want, and the chat or the challenge was 100% corn flour bread. And the solution was how do you, or the way was how do you keep the simplicity of the ingredients um, that I have in my wheat and my rye breads to stay to the essence of who and what Poilin does. Yes. Yeah, that's really interesting because you've got truly not just a, you know, you're not just a bakery, a boulangerie, you, you stand for something. Poilin has, has always been at the forefront of, uh, I would say, the, 
the artisan revival and the, the artisan craft of bread making. So can you talk a little bit about, because uh, I, I want to come back to this cornbread in a little bit, but uh, can talk a little bit about what that philosophy is and what it is that, uh, that are the sort of guiding principles that have allowed Holan to, to be the standard bearer. You, yeah. So when my grandfather started in 1932, Hualan um, was a neighborhood bakery in a neighborhood that was up and coming, where, ba where our clients needed something that would feed them and that would keep. And those were the qualities that my grandfather found um, and offered to our clients at a time where a typical bakery would offer smaller formats and wider breads, mm -hmm. aka the baguettes. Uh -huh. And the thing is, it's a very satisfying bread but what my grandfather's wheat countryside sourdough loaves offered more was the, um, was a taste, was a fulfillment, was also just the sheer um, legacy of one batch to another because we were using sourdough and not yeast. Yeah. Um, my father really uh, structured the business and developed this understanding that bread really is linked to just about anything. Um, and, and it's important because it means that from the library of books on bread that um, he collected to, to the um, to the way he developed his training program for his teams, there was intent and understanding that bread was more than something that was just there to feed you. It was there to nurture you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think Poilin stands for this culture of bread and understanding that bread is not just a food to be looked for sub subsistence. Mm -hmm. It has to have substance. It has to have mm -hmm. a body to it. And that only comes, and this, well, it comes, first of all, it comes all the more naturally for us that we use sourdough, which is a technique. And I hate when people say, or I don't hate, but I think it's, it's unfortunate when people say, oh, just give me a bread, a sourdough bread, because I, you know, there's so many different types of sourdoughs out there. Yeah. We use a piece of dough from one batch, which is a stiff sourdough. Um, and I know, you know, this Peter, but I do want to make sure that our audience here understands yeah. what's specific about the Poilin sourdough. It literally is a piece of dough from one batch. We keep aside, we let to ferment to become sour, hence the word sourdough. And it is a technique to start the following batch. And that creates not only a legacy, but creates a specific taste. And the promise that when you're going to eat through a slice of my bread or one of my breads, because whether it's my wheat or more recently corn, like these are breads that bear the legacy of generations of loaves, generations of bakers, and generations of poilans that have fed and nurtured that ethos. It's like you're tasting so, the lineage of that, exactly. that bread from all the way back to its, yep. to its origins. So at the heart of heart, I believe that baking bread is, and, and of course, you know, working on this book has helped me a lot to decide like, what does it, what is bread? What does it mean to like bake bread? And for me, it's really this crossroads between cereal grains, something that represents a value chain from the guy that sowed seeds to the person that ground them to the bakers that baked the loaf over a year's worth of nurturing from soil to your mouth, breads that will feed you. And that promise is something that grains offer and that are sort of the common um, ground or this, this, this simple, very overt thing, but then there's the magic and the magic comes from the fermentation. Mm -hmm. And the fermentation is the promise that this very simple, very like almost mundane ingredient, even though it represents quite an impressive value chain, is brought to another level. Um, fermentation is 
what makes a different, you know, it's what makes wine, it's what makes yes. cheese, and so many other things that we have on this planet. Yeah, it's and the this transformational, is, it's the transformational ingredient. Exactly, it, it is the transformation. It's, and when I say it's magic, it's not, not, it's not about the fairies. It's really about the understanding that this is um, something very special, something that we have an understanding of, but only to some extent. And in the years to come, we'll develop more of our understanding of it. But at, at the heart of hearts, it is an encounter between all of these worlds. Um, it's not only the grains and the environment, but it's also past presence towards the future. So it's all of these things. Well, this is, you know, I could talk all day with you about this aspect of it because it is, it, it, it's, it's. And we could probably carry on all night as well. <laughs> yeah, true. And we need some, some, some good strong coffee to do that. But, uh, uh, but this, the whole notion of bread as a symbol of transformation is so important to me as I know it is to yeah. you. And before we, this, before we end this segment, because we, we want to be able to go into the bakery with you in this next segment, um, uh, could you uh, talk a little bit about the artwork that's behind you? Because you talked about the culture that the, that Polan sort of, you know, is protecting yeah. and, and, and nurturing. And part of mm -hmm. that is the culture of art and artists, uh, which, uh, and you've got these amazing paintings of Paintings bread behind me, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so when my grandfather started this neighborhood, Saint-Germain-des-Prés, we're in the left bank in the southern part of Paris, um, central south, um, my grandfather had artists, had craftsmen as neighbors, and he started exchanging bread for loaves because like a lot of the gentrification that happened in the early 20th century in Paris and this neighborhood, people started um, baking, um, uh, well, started not being able to pay for their rent. And my grandfather was starting to bake breads. And so it was sort of this very informal and very familiar thing that happened. And so the back room where I'm in right now is where we have some of the pieces of art that my grandfather exchanged for bread. This tradition has been going on ever since. I have pieces from all over the world, all kinds of media, drawings, paintings, um, um, watercolors, sculptures. Sculptures, um, yeah. And all of those really show how art, bread, really fosters the community. And that's, yeah. in many ways, my ABCs. Well, you know, your bread lasts a long time because of that sourdough culture. It, it can, yep. can, you can, you know, it gets better each and every day yep. but for at least a week and then sometimes longer. Uh, but the, the paintings of bread last even longer than the exactly. bread. So that was a pretty good trade, I think, that your grandmother, your grandfather made. It was. Uh, it was, was to have some enduring art that, uh, it that was. keeps that story alive. Now, the funny thing is, when, when the artists would exchange bread, what they would used to say is that what they liked with our loaves was that once they ha were done with the painting, they could eat the model. <laughs> yeah. um, so that I sounds think like an artist. <laughs> <laughs> but but bread but bread really in in is you know and it's 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 no surprise being such an essential ingredient to our lives such an essential food along with wine cheese it's no surprise that it was so it's so symbolic so represented so yes it's extraordinary that each of these paintings represents solidly bred, um, but that also represents how important, how, um, how essential bread is. Do you still have artists that come to you and ask if they could trade art for bread? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Good, so I the do. collection grows? <laughs> the collection's growing. Um, I, two summers ago, received a beautiful eggshell tempera from Canada. Um, I, um, I had, um, a, whether it's a watercolor, um, or a, a ceramics that's right behind me, um, uh, it's the one that's on the lower side, yeah. um, that's, um, that was done by an Austrian artist, um, six months ago. So yeah, we, we do, we do fuel and try and nurture that relationship. And because 
bread is not only a food for the body, but it's also a food for the mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, I don't know if, if, if your camera can catch this, but I think one of the artists that your grandfather did some business with was Salvador Dali, right? There are probably yeah, other exactly. artists who have since become famous, but he certainly is one of the most recognizable names. And can, is there any chance that we can see, is the chandelier still yes. standing? Yes, the chandelier is still standing, but I did want to give you, build you, warm you guys up for a little bit for this one. Okay. So we're in the late 60s. My father is working at the bakery and he, he meets Salvador Dali. And the Spanish artists and the Parisian baker get along quite well <laughs> to the point that Salvador Dali starts asking my father, to make objects made out of bread. So it starts with simple things like a bread frame. Mm -hmm. But then in 1971, he asked my father to make a whole bedroom made out of bread. Wow. Now, imagine my father in his early 20s thinking this guy who's absolutely world famous is asking me to make a whole bedroom made out of bread. Um, um, my father rose up to the challenge with his team, yeah. created a bed, a bed stand, um, a cabinet, uh, and a bread chandelier that were used in his room at Hotel Maurice. Allegedly, so that he could find out if there were mice in his uh, room. Now, you can go on YouTube and find a really beautiful, beautiful segment of my father and Salvador Dali um, reading the furniture, but since then, in the back room of the bakery where I'm standing right now, we've had a bread chandelier as a wink to that experience. Um, so I'm going to tilt my camera so you can see it. Okay. All right. Yeah. There, I, so now the, for those who are on the podcast and can't see this, uh, uh, if you can go to uh, pizzaquest.com and bring up this episode because we're now looking at a chandelier made totally out of bread dough, lit, wired, uh, illuminating the room. Uh, created by Lionel Poilan for Salvador Dali back in, you said, 1972-ish, around that time? Yeah, so it was the early 70s. And what happened was my grandfather was um, had had a stroke, so he couldn't take care of the business. Um, uh, my father rose up and to the challenge. Um, Salvador Dali comes, Dali comes in and asks uh, my father to make this whole bedroom made out of bread. And since then, we've been doing this bread chandelier in our back room as well. And whenever it runs out of, you know, I mean, bread having a lifespan uh, when it's dough, um, yeah. we, we redo it every, every once in a while. Um, and when we redo it, every baker puts their own little touch. And I really insist on this, and I have been insisting on this for the past 18 years, as a way of saying, this is a living tradition. It's not just an homage, it's something that we're keeping alive the same way we keep our sourdough alive. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's uh, like an art restoration project when exactly. the, your artists begin to apply yep. their, their craft to keeping this piece, uh, you know, going. That's right. Yep. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, we're going to take a little break here. And when we come back with Apollonia, uh, you, are you going to take us uh, down into the into the baking area where you can see the ovens? So, so when we come back, um, I unfortunately cannot take you to the bakehouse. We don't have Wi-Fi downstairs. Oh, okay. um, this is as far as I can go, unfortunately. Okay. But um, I can take you into the bakery uh, okay. if yeah. you'd like to a little peek. At least to see we can see some of the products and uh, and the and the front of the house, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Well, uh, please come back for part two with Apollonia Poilan uh, on Pizza Talk. Uh, thank you all for being here for part one. We'll see you in a couple minutes on part two. You should try my the recipe from my book. <laughs> I know. I will. <laughs> all right. Let me jump off just so we don't run out of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we are recording and. Uh, uh, we're back with uh, Apollonia Poilan uh, at, at the Poilan Boulangerie in, in Paris on the left bank. Uh, I've opened your beautiful book, uh, which is called uh, Poilan, uh, well, it's just called Poilan, oh, The Secrets of the World Famous Bread Bakery. But I've opened it up to the page of the cornbread that you were describing in our last segment. And it is just such a 
exciting looking loaf. It's baked in a you know rectangular loaf. It's it's yep. and tight, but you can see the corn. You can almost taste the corn just looking at the photo, and I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, and, and Peter, that's exactly right. Is when you have a slice of that bread in your hand, or when you have a a loaf or of that of that bread, like you can smell this the corn, and if you toast it, then you have smells of popcorn. Yeah, it's yeah. Absolutely amazing with a nice creamy cheese well, with we, some uh, shellfish or or even some duck. Um, yeah. So I'm going to try to make some myself with the first chance I get, and I'll either make, either grind the corn myself or get some Anson Mills. Uh, uh, corn, you know, the corn that they that they mill, which is some some uh, heirloom grains. So it's probably yep. it's closer to what you're using, and uh, and then I'm just going to try to follow this. Uh, in the book, uh, there's a sort of a modified version for the home baker made with yeast. Exactly. But, yes. But anyone who knows how to do sourdough cultures could could replace that with a corn based sourdough starter, right? Kind of like what correct. You're so Correct. This, so thanks for inspiring us on that. And I noticed there's also a rice bread in the book. So are you are you actually making that commercially and selling the, a rice bread, or is that just for the book? So we're not. When I'm so in the book, um, I shared recipes adapted to the home baker um, of breads, cookies, and pastries that I do at the bakery. I've also. And a large portion of the book is also devoted to what to do with bread. Once you've baked all this bread, what are you going to do with it? How do you make sure that you don't waste a single crumb of it um, from when it's, it's its freshest to when it's at its stalest? Mm -hmm. Because I really believe in what I call bread cooking, using bread as an ingredient, not only as a food. But I also explain in in giving my outlook on bread as that crossroads between cereal grains and fermentation, that that has fed my R&D and my work. Mm -hmm. So while in the first segment, I talked to you guys about the research and development that went into the cornbread, um, this applies to other um, grains and rice being one of the most eaten grains of this planet along with wheat, along with corn, I thought it would be really interesting to start, well, to share some of the tests and trials that I do, not only to explain the spirits in which I work, but also to inspire you, reader, listener, experimenter, or just food lover mm -hmm. of what is bread and what kind of, um, how to look at different grains and what flavors they bring on. So the rice flour bread is, combines some jasmine rice and some sushi rice for their binding and their flavors and really works them in more of a pumpernickel-ish style of breads. Mm, yeah. um, so, like, so it's- Dense, dense, dense uh, Exactly, exactly. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, that's another, so that's, so in other words, the, the book has allowed you to um, apply your creativity to create breads that you're not even making at the bakery, but just to show and maybe to empower the reader to not be quite. Creative, Actually, to create their well, own bread. So, so what you're saying is true, but not in that order. So it was actually, this book is really about saying, when you come at the bakery, you see breads, you see cookies, you see pastries. And what you see is really the tip of the iceberg of what's going on in the bakehouse. Um, I started a line of cookies with different grains to explain to people that what they see in the store may seem like a shorter line. And it's true, we only have about 15 different types of breads. Um, we only had one cookie at, at the time and half a dozen uh, pastries. Uh, but nowadays we have seven um, uh, cookies with different grains that are there to show what is the distinctive flavor of different grains, but also to give a sense to my clients of what Poilin stands for and how we work. Because what I realized was when people come to the bakery, oftentimes out of routine and um, on either side, clients and us, um, we tend to like gravitate towards the same 
uh, our, you know, our favorites, our slice of wheat sourdough bread that's um, toasted and um, slab with a little bit of honey for your morning toast or the little canapes you're going to make out of a slice of my rye bread um, with um, you know some fish pâtés or whatnot or some a cheese platter that to it for which you'll use my rye and raisin bread or maybe my corn and hazelnut bread mm -hmm. but but like how can I convey how, all of the work that's happening behind the scenes to my clients and so all of that has been popping up in the form of products like my cookies and I have this range of cookies but the book actually really sort of wants to share with my audience a little bit of what's going on in the bakehouse and just how much creativity goes on um, and when a bread like the cornbread comes out even though it takes 10 it took 10 years for me to put it on my shelf I know that in time we will better the recipe and that in maybe a decade or two, I'll have come to something more stable and that I will be able to, um, you know, have made that bread more mainstream in people's, in people's minds. Right. Cause it's a, cause it's a, an ever evolving process and exactly. Uh, and it can always, you can always find, it never seems to be, it, we always say the quest never really ends. It's and, and mm -hmm. it's really about being on the quest, and it is about getting to the end of the quest. And it sounds like that's what you've discovered too with your with your products is that it's still growing. It's it's a quest. It's a journey. Um, I when when I'm asked about how to bake at home, and bakers are discouraged by their tests and trials. I understand the frustration, but at the same time, what they're not realizing is just how much they're learning because those mistakes are what is um, sharpening their eye, their touch, mm -hmm. all of their five senses to bake a better loaf the following time. Now it may happen or not, regardless, you've, you're building this library of experiences, something that we practice when we're doing our apprenticeships as bakers. Um, my father was, quite keen on hiring bakers with no experience prior because he really thought that you were, you really start from a sort of tabula rasa standpoint, which he felt was more, um, which opened our bakers hearts, minds and hands to baking in a way that's much more intuitive, much more yeah. close to our five senses. Yeah. And still to this day, it's fascinating to see how we've hired people who've had baking experience, but you can tell that that experience has a very limited mm -hmm. advantage. Mm -hmm. um, it really comes down to how open are you yeah. in your heart, but in your five senses to how your environment shapes your day and in the bakery, the season. Um, how your dough reacts on a warm, hot summer day or on a cold, rainy day or a cold, super dry day in Paris or London, where we've been for 20 years now. Right. And that's right in London. And, and I wanted to talk about it. Maybe as you take us through the front of the house and we get to see some yeah. of the products in the bakery, talk a little bit about, you know, where and how these products are made, not just in Paris, but outside of yeah. Paris and London, everywhere. And, yeah. uh, uh, and, but I would like to say, for, for, based on what you told me, the one notion that came to me is if somebody were to ask me, what does Polan stand for? What differentiates them from everybody else? I, I would, to me, what I would say is um, that, that it's all about um, uh, recognizing and evoking the quality of the integrity of the grain. And it's really about showcasing the full potential of, of, yes. of what grain can, can do when can, transformed into bread. And, and, and the legacy of one generation of bakers to the next, of mm. one loaves to the following one, yeah. in nurturing that quest, journey, adventure. Yeah. Love it. I love it. Well, can you, want, want to take us through the front? Is, yep. Can we do I will. that? I will. So, so, well, I'm going to pick up my laptop and okay. show you around. Um, we'll try to so, describe for those who are listening on, just on the podcast side. We'll, we'll exactly. describe this. Can. So but then yeah. you can see us on the on the video. Exactly. Version. 
so right now we're in the back room of the bakery. Um, it is literally the place in which my teams and I normally have breakfast where we prepare the orders where we'll have a meeting in this case, a virtual meeting. Yeah. Um, but it, it is this, it's the office in, you know, an early 20th century bakery. Now I'm going to go outside. Uh, I'll open the door and I'll switch my thing just because so, so I don't cover my face in front of you guys and muffle the sounds um, for sanitary purposes. Um, but I'll, um, the bakery is small, so you'll get a quick sense of, of it. Great. Um, you come into the store and they really are, when I will be coming out from the, the little office, and so we'll be facing the entrance of the bakery. Um, so here we go. Um, so, and you get a little more art in passing. Yeah, I see some um, more. Things. And this is the door. Um, and here we are into the bakery. So, uh, so yeah. you're facing, you're facing the entrance. Yeah, we're looking and out, the, out the big windows onto the street. Exactly. So, so we have um, on either sides of the windows, we display our products, our ba breads, our cookies, our pastries. We also have third party products, uh, what we call accessories, everything that will facilitate your, you know, eating, keeping, and enjoying uh, of our breads. Wow. On this wall, we have all of our products, um, uh, our breads. Loads of breads, yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And on this end, we have all of our accessories. Um, now, and, yeah. Um, and we have up Back here the cushions. The, cushions. <laughs> the little pillow cushions, the, the new yep. book. Uh, the book and the cushions. I'm just going to show you because it's it's got the oh, yeah. key now. <laughs> yeah. You have yeah. you have Peter. You have really an heirloom. You have the, the, the I have the freshest batch. Yeah, beautiful. All right. Um, out of courtesy for my clients, please don't um, uh, leave me for moving back to the back room just oh, no, please. Um, to respect their uh, privacy and also to um, sure. uh, respect well, the sanitary. So a, glimpse the, the, taken. a glimpse of the breads, uh, including the, 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 the two breads that I remember from my visit 20 years ago, you know, were the rye yeah. breads and the, and the, the, the big round. And the wheat breads. Yeah. And then, um, and then uh, you mentioned cookies. So you have the number of cookies that are out there yep. now mm -hmm. as well. And uh, you do, do you do other, uh, anything like uh, uh, pastry type breads? Do you, are you, are exactly. you okay croissants yep. or anything? So we have breads of wheat, breads of rye, breads of corn. We have another family of products, which are the cookies. Uh, we have seven grains that we turn into little sablés. Um, this Normandy where my grandfather was from, um, textured, uh, sandy textured cookies. Um, and then we have our baker's in this, pastries. In this country, we call those cookies sandies. Sandies. <laughs> oh, they're like sandies here. Yeah, the pecan um, sandies, things like that. So, so we have, um, so we, another line of products or another family of products we have and carry is what we call baker's pastries. We bake all of our products from bread to cookie to pastry in our wood-fired brick ovens. Now, these are big beasts and they limit what we can do as far as pastry um, is done. So we do apple tarts, we do apple turnovers, we do custard cake, and then we do what we call in French un gâteau de voyage. Um, in English, some will call them quick breads. I, I'm not sure how good um, a translation is of that because like they're for us they're you know they're they're sweet they're they're sweet loaves they're cakes uh -huh. yeah. um and we literally in french call them the cake which is a french version of of the english words yeah yeah so uh all those different products of uh, and you but you say you still are able to bake them in the wood-fired brick oven exactly you don't have any modern uh, deck ovens, gas fired ovens. No, like no. So they're all, so there's, it's, so our brick ovens are these a hundred ton heavy brick wood fired ovens. There's one opening in which we enter in every loaf. Um, the, um, the baking sheets of cookies and pastries, everything is baked in those. Um, and um, it's, 
the heat of these ovens is quite extraordinary. It's very dry. Um, it's, it's super hot. I was about to say steaming hot, but that's not the case. Um, they, we, at the entrance of the oven, there is a little bowl in which we put water, which gives the little steam and that extra, gives the extra luster to the bread. But, uh, but those ovens are really beautiful because they, they really require from the baker to dialogue with what the heat and the weather it is outside. Because of course, you know, they react in a different way. When they cool down, they retract, and when they heat up, they expand. And that's what makes um, for an interesting heat, an interesting and specific um, quality of products in the end. Uh, well, back in the day, and this is the early, I think late 19th, early 20th century, uh, one of the business, or one of the arguments that salespeople would say to say, by um, by an electrical oven is they were saying it will help the bread retain some of the water in it so it and and therefore because most breads were sold by weight mm. it was their art their commercial argument was you'll be able to sell water at the price of bread <laughs> and and i mentioned this because it's really important to say different ovens have different qualities and you work and, and we've developed our baking practice around ours and yes it limits our, our our pastry range but really at the heart of hearts we are about developing these doughs these sourdoughs and and that's 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 our know-how now in your bakery there in, in Paris yeah. you can only do so many loaves a day for, uh, you know maybe a, a few hundred but your breads are being sold all over and being shipped so my recollection of uh, when I was there uh, it was in, I think it was Bièvre, a uh, mm -hmm. suburb of Paris. Uh, your father had built this manufactory, uh, this big sort of round building with 24, if I get it right, I'm not sure if I'm remembering correctly, so correct me, but like 24 individual baking stations, each one to be helmed by a baker. And each baker would be responsible for essentially recreating the same output that they that the bakers that is working downstairs in your in your your Paris bake shop would do, but basically so that instead of trying to mass produce the breads by systems, they were all handcrafted the same way as in the mother house, but then exactly. twenty four of them, and so exactly. all of a sudden there's like a whole and lot. Of and thirty five years later, it's still the case. So we have four bakeries in Paris. Um, we have one in London, and every um, our bakeries produce throughout the day so that we can cater to clients demand, reduce any waste. Um, outside of Paris, we have 24 of these ovens, same system. And as you said, it allows us to really respond to demand and, you know, up production if we need it, or when it's a slower day, have less bakers, create less, more bake less batches. And that makes for not only like, efficiency in terms of um, the number of loaves we bake, and that's important for wastage uh, purposes. We're not just, you know, just overproducing and then letting it see where it goes and then trying to waste manage. No, we produce to not waste the ingredients mm -hmm. and a year's worth of work from the grain to the flour bag, and then, and let alone the baker's work. Um, so, so that's one thing, and those, 24 ovens and manufacture um, were created by my parents. My mom is an architect mm. and my father as a baker and both of them really combined their talents and their know-hows to create a place where they could produce a purely artisanal quality and yeah. organization yet allowing them to bake quantities that were significant that could respond to demand. It was Our, a genius design. It, it was so designed it, so beautifully it, that I still think of it, you know, 20 years later with, in yeah. wonderment and awe. Well, it's, it's, it's genius design. It's a craft and a know-how and a way of going about our craft that allows for it. Um, and you know what's the best part about it? Is that 35 years later, it still works. It's yeah. the same yeah. method. Yeah, so that it. means it's time proven. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many 
plants and factories out there that, you know, basically the minute it's finished, a new extension is done, it's obsolete already. This place has been around for 35 years yeah, and yeah. works. And it's still going to keep working. I mean, the, the indelible memory I have of it uh, is in the center of this round building with these 24 stations sort of around the perimeter. In the center, there was this humongous pile of wood, of firewood. Yep. That was just built in, and then there was kind of like a claw. So that's our stock. That would, yep. that would come down, grab the wood, take it to a chute. The wood would pop out on the other side of the wall to the in the little individual bakeries, where yep. the baker would then gather his wood, stack them, and prepare his fire. And every station had this this the chute of of wood coming through from this giant pile. It was it was it, it was it was like uh, Willy Wonka land for breads. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, one hundred percent. It's a Willy Wonka of bread. And my parents chose the word manufacture because it really represents the, the, the fact that our human hands are our main tool. Um, and, you know, whether it's um, Chad Robertson um, who called his manufacture manufacture yeah. in, in San Francisco, he, um, he, he referred to it. My, my, my parents' place was there in his inspiration. Exactly. Pierre Hermé, uh, with his manufacture in, in, um, in Alsace, um, had the same inspiration. Um, uh, my, my, my parents' uh, work, and, and it's become quite, quite a popular term these days, but I think it's super important just to pause for a second and think, yeah, yeah. these are our human hands that are doing this. I remember your, your father telling me that very thing. And uh, even now, even today in the United States, there's a growing movement called These Hands, the These Hands movement. And this is the symbol. It's just two, a pair of hands with fingers outspread. Uh, but he said- That's yeah, the only tool you need when you're baking bread, I guess. This is the original tool that God gave us. <coughs> and, and you don't need anything beyond that. Everything else is an embellishment. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and now, of course, what's old is new again. And uh, the, uh, one of the other sayings that we hear a lot is, is the future of bread lies in its past. And, and, and that re refers to fermentation methods, especially. Yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, I'm glad you're saying this because it also to me echoes what my father's philosophy, retro innovation, really um, speaks to. Um, having a look at the past and seeing like, what were the great things there that were, time proven and that still work being my father was an avid um, new technology lover but he also he was it was at the end of the day it was in his baking practice it was about finding the best of past and contemporary techniques to nurture tomorrow's sourdough um, not being this absolute quest of what is the newest technique, uh, trying it, not being afraid of, of, of venturing out, but also understanding that, you know, it may or may not be the most optimal thing. Sometimes, as you said, future lies in the past. Yeah. Well, Apolloni, we really appreciate the fact that you ha are continuing the family lineage, uh, growing it, adding to it, and hopefully uh, you've got another generation behind you that uh, were nurtured the way you were because, uh, you know, sound, I remember your dad probably grew up uh, as a child in the bakery learning that you did every single part of the operation. And then yep. when the time came, he took it, you know, the, he took on the reins and then you have done the Correct. same. And uh, all we can say is that uh, we're grateful for that. And we thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge, both at the, at the bakery, uh, in this conversation, in your book, and in, in ultimately in your breads, which, which are the transmission of everything you stand for. <laughs> well, as you say, um, it is a transmission. It's a sharing. It's no surprise that the word coupon is someone with whom you share bread. Mm -hmm. But it's also because people like you, Peter, people like um, the men and women out there who are listening to us, um, because you guys because us people are all focusing and or paying attention, listening and nurturing um, these traditions, keeping them alive, that we're able to all carry on our crafts. It's a collective work. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank uh, you. I'm you come back. Okay. I'm looking forward to having you again at our Bread Symposium. We're working on, you know, bringing it back. Uh, we had to postpone this year's. You were going to be one of our featured mm -hmm. speakers. Uh, and uh, so we're going to have you as a featured speaker in 2021, 2021 when we bring it back yep. into our virtual symposium. So uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we won't be able to fly you over here to do it in person, but we'll bring you over just like we did today. And, uh, and thank you for everything that you do. And we will look forward to seeing you in the near future. Likewise, likewise, Peter. And thank all of you for joining us on Pizza Talk today. We're with Apollonia Polan. And uh, join us on the next episode of Pizza Talk uh, coming very soon.